Um, happy Mother's Day to all the mothers, and just know before I get started that everything that I'm about to preach today is under attack today. Um, everything that the Bible says about motherhood is being attacked in every detail today. So we need to know what those attacks are. We need to know what those details are so we can defend against um, those things for our wives and our mothers. So look down at verse number 20 where the Bible says, My son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. So we're going to look at this in more detail, but you see here how the Bible talks about a father and mother in this verse, and then it talks about how important it is in verse number 21 where it says, Bind them continually upon thine heart and tie them about thy neck. So here we see a father and a mother working together to you know, instruct the children and give a law or give commandment to the children. But there's two different roles here. The mother has a, a role um, as this lawgiver. We're going to look at that in just a few minutes. But first of all, let's look at the Bible plan for mothers. All right, look at verse number, keep your place in Proverbs 6. We're going to go back to verse number 20 in a few minutes. But turn, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. Let's look at the father's um, difference. You know, when when Adam and Eve sinned against God and God, you know, declared the curse upon them, the curse was different for fathers as it was. It was different for Adam than it was for Eve. Look at verse number 17, and we see what God's, you know, command to Adam or, you know, the leader of his family, the father, the husband was. Look at verse number 17. It says, and unto Adam, he said. So he's only speaking to the man here. Because thou hast hearkened unto the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. So what were they doing before in the garden? They were just walking around in the garden, and they were just eating whatever they, they could eat. They had everything provided for them. God handled everything. They did not have to go out and, you know, gather or do any of those things. But God says, because you listened to your wife and because you disobeyed me, that that is changing for you now. And he's talking to who? He's not talking to both of them. He's talking to Adam here. Look at verse, or the rest of the verse. He said, um, thou shalt not even, he says, cursed is the ground for thy sake. In sorrow shalt thou eat of it all the days of thy life. So just in my Bible, I have those two words like underlined right there. It's really important for a man to understand those two words. The Bible is saying, that providing and, you know, even just getting food and providing for your family, which is your job, Adam, he's talking to him, is going to be done in sorrow. So this just answers the question of, you know, to, the, to all the young men out there today. They're like, well, you know, you know, work stinks or whatever. Yeah, it, it's, you know, you're going to go to work and you're going to have, it's going to be in sorrow. You know, that's why it's called, this is what my dad used to always say to me, that's why it's called work and not fun. Because, I mean, the Bible literally says that. The Bible says that this is going to be done in sorrow. Your job is going to be fulfilled in sorrow. Then he gets even more detailed. He says, thorns and also thistles shall bring it forth to thee, verse 18. And thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Look at verse 19. In the sweat of thy face shall thou eat bread till thou return to the ground, till thou turn 62 years old and retire and do nothing for the next 30 years of your life. No, he's saying... You're going to go and you're going to toil and you're going to sweat and you're going to be, you know, you're going to work hard to provide for your family all the days of your life. The days of walking through the garden, just having everything done for you are over now. You're going to have to go and toil in sorrow, in sorrow. All right. Look, so that's for the men. Get out there and toil is what God is saying. That's the curse. Now turn to Titus chapter number two and let's look at, you know, the role of the mother. We're not focusing on the men this morning, but I just want to point that out, that the Bible is very clear that men's, men's roles and women's roles are different in the family. They're different in a marriage. They're different in a family structure. Look at Titus chapter 2 and verse number 5. And if you want to keep a bookmark in Titus chapter 2, we're going to go back there towards the end of the sermon. But look, this is what the Bible says the wives um, in the household should be. It says they should be discreet, chaste, and then look at these two words right here. These, these are bad words today. This is, a, this is a, 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 a vulgar phrase today where the Bible says, keepers at home, good, obedient to their own husbands, that the word of God be not blasphemed. Seems pretty serious. 
The Bible's saying this is what the wife's role is to be. The wife is to be at home doing what? Keeping it. Keeping the home. Now look, the Bible, I hope I can show, you, show this to you this morning, the Bible just makes a lot of sense. The Bible is not only just tells us things, but it just, it just makes logical sense. It's the world today that makes no sense. It's the world today that has everything backwards, opposite, upside down. The Bible actually makes sense. I'm going to give you an analogy today that unless you're over 40, you're probably not going to exactly get, but I'm going to try to explain it to you so you get it. In the, in the mid-80s, the very first computer came out. I was in grade school, and the very first computer, imagine this, the very first computer, it was an Apple IIe. Raise your hand if you know what the Apple IIe computer was. Nobody except me and, and one other person. But an Apple IIe was this, you know, it had the blinking cursor. It was the first Apple computer that was in the schools. And they had the first video game that was in on the Apple IIe computer. And I used to play this video game all the time in library hour or whatever it was. And the game was called Oregon Trail. And the game was called Oregon Trail. And basically the video game, here was the graphics of the video game. It was like this, these narrated paragraphs. It's like you and your family are headed on that you just read this green narrated paragraph. And then it kind of tells you, it was kind of like a choose your own adventure book on a screen. If you ever, who remembers choose your own adventure books? Has anyone ever? Okay, there we go. All right. Now, you would read these things and then it would give you choices of what to do. And I always just like, if you got some money, it says, what do you want to buy at the store? And I would just, all I would spend my money on was ammunition. <laughs> That's all I would ever buy. Just ammo. And whenever I had a choice to do something, like I would never buy medicine. I would never buy like blankets or anything like that. It was just ammunition. That's it. Because all I wanted to do was go hunting. Because you could choose, like, what do you want to do now? And you could choose, like, all these different things. And hunting was one of the things. Because it was really neat. Like, you'd have this little deer that would run across the screen. It would, like, blink. It would go, like, bleep, 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 bleep. And then you would, you would be this little guy down here, and you would shoot. And then the, the thing would go, and you would have to meet the deer with the, the bullet or whatever. It was like, I mean, you probably can't imagine that if you played video games today. But all I would do was buy ammunition and go hunting. And my family always died. <laughs> on the Oregon Trail. We never made it. We never made it. We always died because it was like, oh, you know, somebody is sick and you need medicine. And I had like 300 pounds of venison and no medicine. <laughs> or sometimes even the meat, like, you know, the meat like rotted and people got sick because there was so much rotted meat in my wagon or whatever. And like we never had any medicine or any other kind of supplies. It got cold. We had no blankets. But I was just like, I want to go hunting again. Hunting, hunting, hunting. But the point is, in real life, that would make no sense on any level, to just constantly do that and constantly do that. But here, it's the same thing that we're being told today. It's the same thing we're being told today. I mean, basically, the husband is to be out providing and, and going out and basically hunting and gathering in the family. That's what the Bible is telling us in Genesis chapter number 3. And then the woman is to be at home, the wife and the mother is to be at home keeping the home, organizing things. And we'll look at what the details of that are in just a few minutes. But there's two different roles there. It would make no sense for both people just to constantly go hunting. The family wouldn't make it. They wouldn't make it to the West Coast. Just like going hunting constantly on the Oregon Trail. It's kind of like, here's another, just a simpler analogy. A car, you have a car, a car needs an engine and it needs tires. But what if we just got rid of the tires and we just bought two engines, but the car had no tires? Or what if, I mean, if you just flip it around. What if you just got rid of the engine and you bought two sets of tires, but you had no engine at all? It doesn't make any sense, but that's what the world is teaching us today. That's what the world is telling us about families. It's like, forget this role over here. It's not important. Just have two of this role. It makes no sense on any level. No business would operate that way. No business would say, get rid of this half of the business and just double up on management or whatever. And look, it wouldn't make any sense. The business would fall apart. The business was, would fail. But the most important business in this world, the business of the family, of the, of the family structure, that's what we're being told to accept today. Just get rid of half of the role and just double up on, on another role and everything 
we'll be fine. You say, but yeah, but money. Yeah, but money, we need more money. Here's the thing, even from a financial perspective, for most people, having two people work when there's children involved makes no financial sense at all. Oh, and I updated these numbers with all our inflationary uh, stuff that's going on today. In California, as of October 2023, in California, childcare per year for a baby is $17,000 a year for one infant. That's average. For, for a toddler, it's like, it's a little cheaper. It's like 12,000 a year. But the point is you add, you add taxes onto this and you add all these different things. A mom literally has to make over 50, $60,000 a year in order to even break even on this. And it gets, it's even worse, and I'll point that out later, it's worse than that. But just say, say that a mom, because like, oh, there's a lot of people where maybe, you know, the two people, you know, living in the Bay Area, like you, there's no way you could live there unless two people made 100, over $100,000 a year, basically. But say, say a mom even made six figures. You're literally working until June for free every single year. I mean, it doesn't make much sense at all. Turn to Proverbs chapter 31. So let's look at this idea of keeping it home, keeping the home. This is, you know, the, the word, you know, homemaker is just looked down upon and is just, you know, denigrated by our society today. Somebody that would keep the home, be a homemaker. What's it all about? What does it mean? Let's look at the Bible case for motherhood this morning. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Look at verse number 13. Of course, we're looking at um, the virtuous woman in Proverbs chapter 31. This is a busy woman. She's constantly, she's doing a lot of work here. She's laboring here, but she's laboring for the household. Look at verse number 13. It says, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant's ships. She bringeth her food from afar. I want you to notice the two themes. I'm going to keep reading here for another couple verses, but notice the two themes that the Bible is pointing that this woman is working towards. Look at verse number 15. She riseth also while it is yet night, and giveth meat to her household, and a portion to her handmaid. So what do we see? We see she's, I mean, this is not a lazy woman. She is laboring with her hands. She is getting up early, but she's bringing food from afar. She's giving meat to her household. Verse 16. She considereth the field and buyeth it. With the fruit of her hand, she planteth a vineyard. She's growing food. In verse 17, she girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. Look, it takes, it takes being in, in shape and being active to do a lot of work like this. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. And look at this in verse 19. She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. Now, the Bible here is focusing on two main things that this woman is doing. She is providing food and clothing for her household. She is literally growing food. She is going and getting food for her household and providing that food for her, uh, everyone in the household, even the people that are hired to help um, the household in this case. But also clothing. She's making sure one way or another that everyone has it. Now, let me ask you a question. As keeping the home, as someone that would be a homemaker is just looked down upon like it's unnecessary, what do you do all day, all these things, are food and clothing, are they necessary? Are flu food and clothing important? Just look at your life, even if you're not married, even if you're a single person, are food and clothing important things? Of course they are. These are very important things. Look. Clothing, she's making sure that everyone has it. Sometimes guys have asked me, like, some guy, guys have asked me, like, hey, where'd you get that shirt? I'm like, I have no idea. I have a magical closet. Many times, I don't even know, most times, this is how it works in my house, I don't even know I need a new shirt. My wife would just tell me, you need some new work shirts. I'm like, I do? And then they just magically show up. I don't know what color they are. I don't know, I hope they match the pants, but I don't know where the pants came from either. He's like, oh, your wife dresses you. She provides clothing for my household. She provides clothing for me. She even knows when I need it before I know that I need it. She provides clothing for the children. Look, people in my household even make clothing. 
My daughter makes a lot of clothing, and it, look, it is complicated. I look at what she's doing, and I can't believe the things that she makes, and I look at what she, and I just, it's probably easier to build a bridge than do some of those things that she's doing on the table with all those patterns and all the sewing and all that stuff. But look, that is a valuable skill to have. Amen. Providing clothing. You know, how about this? Well, let's say providing clothing, is that it? Well, what about clean clothing? What if you just never cleaned your clothes? How would that go for you? Would you have a job for very long? Look, someone has to do these things. Everyone needs clothing. Everyone needs clean clothing. Look, it's many diff there's many differences today. We're not rubbing things on washboards. We have machines and things like this. But the point is, clothing is very important. It is very important to the function of a household, from the, the wife to the husband to the children, having clothing. And guess what? It's also a way to save a lot of money. It's also a way to save a lot of money. I wouldn't know where to start. Sometimes, there have been a couple times where I had, a, I remember about last year, I had an emergency meeting and I needed a certain type of shirt. I needed like a black polo shirt. And I went, I just drove to JCPenney's and I just bought it and it was like $65. And my wife just looked at like the tag on the shirt and she's like, like you literally paid like triple or quadruple of what I would have paid for a shirt. But the point is like, a woman keeping the home has, a, has a, a, an ability to save a lot of money. This is why the Bible says in Proverbs 31 that her husband, one of the reasons that her husband has no need of spoil. Because his, his wife is going out and she's doing these things that, look, they have a major financial impact on the family. Amen. Meaning, look, there, there's two different ways to make more money. Number one, you can literally make more money. But number two, you can waste less money. Literally, if you go out and you have somebody that, you know, uh, an appliance repairman or a plumber that would come to your house and charge you $300 to fix something, if you can go and fix that thing yourself, you literally saved yourself $300. You, I look at that as like you increased your income by $300 by just knowing how to do that. It's the exact same thing with the keeper at home. She has the ability to financially affect her household majorly in a positive way. Oh, but she's not out there making money with the job. What's the difference if you're wasting less money? It doesn't make any sense what the wor world is teaching today. That's what I'm trying to get you to see. What's the next thing? Food. When's the last time you went out to a restaurant? The average home-cooked meal is less than $4, about $3 and some cents per person in the house. If you just factor that out to one meal a day at a restaurant, like, restaurant prices have doubled in the last four years. You take your family out to a restaurant, it has doubled. And all the guys are nodding their heads that have kids and, and a family. You could say, I mean, just on the average, one meal a day saves almost $2,000 a month. That's more than a lot of people make. Just from making home-cooked meals. Oh, you know, you know you're, you're a homemaker and you just cook and clean. What, what, what in the world? It's a big deal. It's a big deal to the financial bottom line for a family. Almost $2,000 a month. That's just one meal a day. Many people go to restaurants more than once a day. This is why the husband has no need of spoil, because he has a wife that's home, a mother that's home, doing these things. She's making clothing. She's making food. She's growing food in this case. Literally the same monetary effect as having a job except she stays home. And then people will, people will, and I'm going to talk about this in detail in just a few minutes, but people will just, oh, you know, cooking and cleaning, they'll equate that to like slave labor. They'll equate that to slave labor. Well, I'm going to give a comparison to a working man and a stay-at-home mom towards the end of the sermon, and we'll see which one has more freedom, and we'll see how that looks. But look, I, I tell my wife that all the time. It's like, man, I'm not free. <laughs> every hour of every day, somebody else is telling me what to, where to be, what to do. It, it's, you know, a man, that's what the Bible is saying in Genesis chapter 3, a man is going to be under yoke. That's what God is explaining. Because you disobeyed me, you, man, Adam, are going to be under a yoke for the rest of your life. The sweat of your face in sorrow. Look, everything about what is being taught about motherhood today 
is untrue. Go back to Proverbs chapter 6 and look at verse number 20. Here's another important role of the biblical mother. Look at Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 20. I read it for you earlier at the beginning of the sermon, but I'll read it for you again. The Bible says, My, my son, keep thy father's commandment and forsake not the law of thy mother. She is literally laying down the law. That is what the Bible is saying, is that the mom is the lawgiver. And you say, well, for who? Well, the, the, the statement answers that question. For the children. She is to lay down the law for the children in her house. Thy mother, the law of thy mother. She is the implementer of the law in the home. So how is she going to do that if she is not there is the question. Here's an age-old mistake on leadership. You cannot lead. And look, it's from, this is, this is an age-old truth right here. From the military to businesses to any kind of leadership, you cannot lead if you are not present. It is not possible. Just think of it from a military perspective. I don't know, um, you know if you know a lot of uh, military history or military ranks or whatever, but literally the military has put in certain positions in the military because they know this is true. So you have a, you know, a, a platoon in the, in the military, in the army, or you know, whatever branch of the service. We usually be, you, know, um, you have a lieutenant in charge. But then what they always do is they have an enlisted man who's a sergeant, or sometimes I think in the Navy it's called a chief, who's the enlisted man who's really running things on the ground. Because they know you could just never take an officer, put him in charge, and he's not on the ground, he's not with the men, he's not in the trenches, it won't work. So they have someone that is there to implement the command of the officer that's what? That's present. That's there in the battle, in the field, because leadership that is not present does not work. Period. Think about, I mean, I've seen this in my career so many times. You have an engineer that makes plans and never leaves the office. Many times this is a very bad engineer because he doesn't go out and see how those plans are implemented, it makes him a poor leader of his design because he doesn't understand the problems that his plans will you know, have when they're being implemented in the field. The good engineer is one that makes plans but also goes out in the field and is there to help lead the implementation of his plans. He will be smarter, he will come up with better plans, and he will be a great leader in the field. One that is not present in the field will never be a good leader, period. You cannot lead if you are not present. So the mom is to be the lawgiver, the Bible says. Where it, so she needs to be present. That is what the Bible is saying. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter number 6. To give the law in the home to the children, you must be there. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse number 6. Let me turn there myself because we're going to look at other verses um, in this chapter uh, as well. But Deuteronomy chapter 6, look at what the Bible says in verse number 6. It says, And these words which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them, verse 7, diligently unto thy children, and shall talk of them when thou sittest in thine where? In thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. So here we see the implementation of Proverbs chapter 6 and verse number 20. The mom is diligently teaching the children, but where is she? She's with the children. She's with the children in the house. Now, notice when the Bible repeats things, the Bible's trying to tell you something. Notice a, a word that pops up in verse number 7, house. Look at verse number 9. Same word, house. Verse 11, house. Verse 12, house. Verse 22, I think that one says household. But the point is this. She's in the house. She's there. She's present as she gives the law. Now, let me ask you today, when 90% of mothers are in the workforce, who's in the house? The answer is no one. Who's given the law? Someone. I wish you could say that, oh, if the mother's not giving the law to the children, 
They just have to wait till they get home to get the law. But here's the problem. Somebody's given the law. Here's the problem. The mother's not there. Guess what? The children aren't there either, and somebody else is giving the law elsewhere. But guess what? It's some other law. Guess what? It's some other God. It's no God. It's some other twisted, perverted doctrine. Somebody is always going to give the law to the children. That's why Satan needed to get the mother out of the home. Because Satan wants to give the law. Satan wants to give the doctrine. Satan wants to give the worldview. But the mother in the home who's giving the law, Satan has no chance. Amen. This is the biblical role of the mother. And this is how important it is. And that's why I talked about a couple weeks ago how there's been this conspiracy for decades in this country to get the mother out of the home. We got to get this mom out of there. Look, we know how this is going. Look at the next generations coming up. We see the results of this. Go back to Proverbs chapter 31. Can't the dad give the law, though? Can't the dad give the law? What, what, is, the, what is the mother? It, well, the, the mother is designed to give the law to the children. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Look at Proverbs chapter 31. Look at verse number 26. I'm trying to prove to you this morning that God's plan is always the best plan. Amen. That if you follow God's plan, even if you don't understand God's plan, even if God's plan seems painful to you in this world, if you follow God's plan, it will work for you. Amen. Look at Proverbs chapter 31, verse number 26. She openeth her mouth with wisdom. What's she doing? She's given the law. And her, in her tongue is the law. Oh, but this is different. Of kindness. Where's she at, though? She's, this, this woman here is not in the boardroom. She's not in the factory. She's not in the office. She's in the home, and she's giving the law. But she's given the law of kindness. Look, I've had to come home and give the law in my house before. And let me tell you something. It was not kind. I, I can lay down the law. And my wife has actually told me it's not kind. It is the law of kindness that comes from a mother. Turn to Isaiah chapter 66. Yeah, dad can lay down the law. And many times dad needs to lay down the law. Because many times with the children, the law of kindness, you know, doesn't work. But that's why dad is there, to come in and lay down the law, maybe without that kindness. But in general, on a regular basis, the, the mother is designed to give the law to the children in kindness. Look at Isaiah chapter 66 and verse number 13. Just as the, the, Bible, the Bible explains it, this, this is just the, the role of a mother. This is just how mothers are. As one whom his mother, what? Comforteth. So will I comfort you, and you shall be comforted in Jerusalem. God is literally comparing his love for us and how he wants to treat us as how a mother would love and comfort her children. So a mother is specifically, look, women are uniquely crafted to, to give the law to children. Women are uniquely, look, they are just uniquely designed to teach children. I'll prove it to you. You know that if you go and you look at the stats in the public, it, this is just a natural thing. No one has to teach women this. If you even look at the public school system that you could say is a far cry from being a bastion of Christian educators today. As a matter of fact, I would say that because of the way the public school system is and the things that it is teaching, it has driven out most of the Christian people as administrators and educators. Yet still, 77% of teachers today in the public school system are women. Why? Because they are naturally inclined to teach children. It is in their nature. It's, it's, it's designed in, it's baked into the cake of their conscience. Nature shows us this. Even, I mean, even in a secular environment, you still see that. Women have the demeanor, they have the comfort, they have the nurturing nature to teach children the law. And that's why it's such a perfect Design. That's why the homeschool mom is such a perfect natural fit. 
for the law to be taught to the children. Yeah, look, it's great sacrifice and it may, you know, cost some money and it may, you know, maybe the, the ladies and the moms and I, I won't speak for my wife, but maybe there's days where you feel like you're not so comforting and it feels like maybe it's even costing you your sanity some days. But it is a natural, perfect fit of God's design to have a mother at home teaching the children. It's perfect. Look, I mean, all these people that say that keeping the home and giving the law to children, they, you know, one of the most annoying questions that I've heard asked to a stay-at-home mom from a mom that does not stay at home, and it's ironic just on its face, is what do you do all day? I would like to do that, but I don't know what I would do all day. That's like someone who, that's like someone who is just, doesn't know the first thing about being an engineer, walks up to someone that like designed like a, a super complicated rocket or something, and you're just like, yeah, that doesn't seem that hard. Because they know nothing about it because they don't do it. They know nothing about the job because they don't do the job. But, you know, look, the less you know, unfortunately, the, the more you think you know, you know, in this world, in many different things. But the thing is, if moms are bored, they're not doing it right. Because giving the law is a complicated, hard job. Just read Proverbs 31. That's why that woman has to be such a hard worker. She has to be so you know, dedicated to her job. She's not getting much sleep. She is just constantly at it for her household, for her children every single day. So the point this morning is this. God's way is always better. God's way is, and look, it's a better life. The world today is lying to these young ladies. The world today is lying to all these little girls and young ladies about being a mother, being a wife, staying home. They're lying. They're just straight up not telling the truth. I mean, nobody is telling my wife what to do every single hour. Nobody is telling my wife when to clock in and when to clock out. A man that goes to work, he has no choice about what he's going to do that hour. He has no choice about what he's going to work on, where he's going to go. And that's the way it was designed, and that's what God said in Genesis chapter number 3. Look, my, my wife's home is her fortress of solitude. I mean, she can have the freedom to do what she wants to do. But look, with freedom comes a lot of responsibility. And people, another thing people will teach today, and this isn't the point of the sermon, is that oh, all we need is freedom. Wrong. You need freedom attached with God's word. All we need is freedom. That's the enlightenment right there. All we need is freedom. And it doesn't matter how sick and disgusting the people get. As long as we have freedom, wrong. Because then people have freedom to blaspheme God, freedom to worship the devil, freedom to do all the things that this clown world is doing today. But the point is, freedom plus responsibility, freedom plus God's word, equals a great and wonderful thing. So look, we need to appreciate our mothers today because they are under attack. We need to appreciate our wives today because they are under attack. They are so vital to the home. They are so vital to the family. They are so vital to the next generation. And what else matters? What else matters in the Christian life than raising another generation that successfully wants to serve the Lord with their lives? that successfully wants to go walk down the street with the Bible in their hand and preach the gospel to those who are lost. What is more important than that? Ultimately, this shows you how important our mothers are to the kingdom of heaven itself. Right. Yep. Turn back to Titus chapter number 2. That's why Satan must attack the role. There's an agenda and we need to fight it. You say, well, you know, maybe I don't have little kids in the home anymore. Well, let me show you an ironic thing about mothers and about women in Titus chapter 2. Their role of teaching never stops. As a matter of fact, the context of the wives being discreet, keepers at home, good, obedient to their husbands, the context of that is they're being taught that by older ladies. Look at verse number 4, verse number 3. The aged women likewise, that they be in behavior as becometh holiness, not false accusers, not given to much wine, 
teachers of good things. Notice how they're still laying down the law. So don't be this mother that when your children grow up, you're like, oh, you know, I'm not homeschooling anymore, and, you know, that must mean that I have less value. No, you are always to be a lawgiver. That's right. And the Bible says in verse number 4 that they may teach the young women who have not been or are entering that chapter of their lives how to do what they did, to teach them how to teach the law to their children. How to keep their home. How to do the things that their family needs them to do. These ladies never stop being teachers. That's what the Bible is showing us here. They never stop giving the law. And look, they're going to be out there preaching the gospel, giving the law to people that they don't even know for as long as they can. We've got ladies who are just of all ages preaching the gospel in this church. And praise God for that. So look, don't let Satan attack this role. I read something that was really interesting this week. It was put this way. As this world, as this culture in the West attacks all these biblical truths, this culture will fail. You say, why will it fail? And I, it was put this way in this article that I read. It will fail because it's caught between a rock and a hard place. The rock is Jesus Christ. And guess what? Men, we are to be the hard place. We are to be the place that defends our wives. We are to be the place that this culture breaks itself upon when people are attacking our wives and denigrating them for being a stay-at-home mom. And denigrating them and speaking down to them for doing the most important role that God says they have in their life. We need to call those things out. We need to be that hard place that this wicked culture breaks itself upon. Amen. The rock's not moving. Amen. The word of God is not moving. We just need to let this rock make us a hard place so we can defend our families. Amen. And we can keep our wives, our mothers, this precious, valuable asset for generations to come in our families. We can keep them from these attacks. So look, I appreciate the mothers that work so hard. These mothers that are teaching the law to their children, you will never, let me tell you something, let me give you another blanket statement, you will never regret this. You will never regret it. There may be days where you think this isn't working. There may be days when you're teaching the kids and you say, I'm a horrible teacher because they're not getting this. There may be days where you feel like you weren't designed for this. You need to push through those days because this is what you were there for. And it is the role that is keeping our families together and protecting these children. All these problems that we talk about, we're not going to have to worry about these problems because of these lawgivers that we have in our home. So praise God for the stay-at-home moms. Praise God for the homeschooling moms this morning. You're so important. Happy Mother's Day. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.